Good morning, everyone. I am Pat Matthews, Associate Dean for Academics and University College. Welcome to the second talk in our MLA lecture series. The Master of Liberal Arts, or MLA, fosters intellectual breadth through courses that address a range of issues from different academic disciplines. In the same spirit, the MLA lecture series considers a theme from diverse perspectives and hopes that each conversation enriches the next. A bit of logistics before we begin, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. You can submit questions at any time and our speaker will field these at the end of the talk. You'll also see a chat button. John Hinderleiter, our marketing director, who many of you may remember from previous lectures, will be on hand to address technical issues that you post in the chat. Our theme this year is unprecedented times and in the past year certainly feels that way. We're in the final stages of a historic second impeachment trial for a US president. The Black Lives Matter movement and civic protest over racial injustice is not new, but the size of the protest this summer may be truly unprecedented. And the inequities and racism fueling the movement were brought to the fore both during the response to the unprecedented riot at our nation's capital and in the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic with greater exposure and worse outcomes for black and brown people. So I'm especially grateful to hear from this week's speaker, Professor Jeff Ward, whose scholarship examines the racial politics of social control and pursuit of social justice. Jeff Ward is professor of African and African American studies and faculty affiliate in the Department of Sociology and the American Culture Studies program at WashU. He's the author of the award-winning book, The Black Child Saviors, Racial Democracy and Juvenile Justice, and his work appears in numerous academic journals and anthologies. He is the recipient of grants from the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Justice, the Ford Foundation, and the Mellon Foundation. Ward is also a founding me member of the Reparative Justice Coalition of St. Louis, a community-based organization working to commemorate histories of racist violence and to address their legacies in our region. Relatedly, the title of his talk today is Monumental Anti-Racism. From your home, please send welcoming thoughts to our speaker, Jeff Ward. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here and to share this work. Um, I'm really appreciative of uh, the opportunity and, and more so even the forum itself uh, that, that Washington University and University College um, have created this program to uh, engage broader audiences in uh, thinking about important issues of the day. Um, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I was excited to hear about this theme, unprecedented times, and, and you know, Pat was just saying how it, it feels that way. And, and part of what I want to do today is uh, talk about the precedents uh, of today and in relation to this work she mentioned on legacies of racial violence and um, and and this question of inheritance. And I start with this picture, um, this question, this issue of structural inheritance, I'll, I'll, I'll unpack a bit more. And really what I wanna get after is this, I, the possibility of disinheritance. How do we disinherit um, the structures of inequality that we, uh, that are created by histories of racial violence? Uh, this arresting image from our nation's capital, um, I think is a appropriate place to begin a consideration of the idea and practice of monumental anti-racism and, its, and its, its potential, but also the idea of inheritance, of structural inheritance. Um, uh, you know, the, the, this uh, Black Lives Matter ended up emblazoned on a street in our nation's capital leading to the White House, not only because of uh, events of uh, the past year, several years, but really uh, uh, because of the entire history of this, of this Republic, the history of settler colonialism, of empire, of enslavement and their afterlives. And so this is really the focus of our, my discussion today. And I'm looking forward to um, um, having some time for dialogue. So three key ideas I wanna work through. One is that this, I, these are precedent at times and here I'm gonna show how social research demonstrates 
the continued impact of historical racial violence is relates to contemporary patterns of conflict, and violence, and inequality in the same places today. Uh, I'm going to argue that we are uh, drawn other scholars who are uh, explaining that we are implicated in historical trauma um, through an inheritance of structural inequality that was uh, that was created by this his these histories of racist violence. So you know, uh, for example, the idea you know many pe people will say, well, my 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 uh, my grand my grandparents didn't, my great grand my ancestors didn't own slaves. But we have all collectively inherited a society uh, where structures of inequality were shaped by uh, uh, slavery, the, uh, the exploitation, the, the dispossession, the extraction that is so central to racial capitalism. And so I'm going to talk more about that today. And then really what I'm, what I'm interested in is whether we can counter these legacies of racial, racist violence or effectively disinherit the structure of inequality through anti-racist memory work. And, uh, and the theory here, which maybe we could talk more about, I'm not gonna go into at great length, but the theory is that anti-racist commemorative work, and I'm gonna share a number of examples, has the potential to transform our national identity and our uh, political culture, which we can see clearly today um, uh, continue uh, our national identity and political culture continue to be inflected by this idea of white supremacy or the idea that America is a white country. And, um, and so we, we continue to be, we, we've inherited this problem uh, and we continue to try to, uh, many of us to dismantle it. So first to the precedented times. Um, you know, I've been very interested in, I'm a sociologist and I've been a uh, sociologist been studying race for a long time and in many ways. And I became really interested in the time arc of racialized violence and its harm. You know, how does it affect populations over time? And this really grew out of my earlier work on the racial politics of juvenile justice and the rise and fall and the haunting remnants of the Jim Crow juvenile justice system. But uh, we may come back to that later, but, but let's start with this image just to get into this point of um, the spatial and temporal dynamics. So this is a map from Natchez, Mississippi on the Mississippi River. Um, uh, Natchez was one of many Ku Klux Klan strongholds in the 1960s. And this map uh, shows the residences of registered Klan members. Um, and I wanna make two quick points about this map. One is if you were in 1966, Natchez, and let's say riding your bike, and you are African American, uh, and you are driving a car, and your car or bicycle broke down, and you needed to walk back home. The route you would take could be quite determinative of your life chances, uh, the prospects that you would be assaulted, uh, harmed in some other way, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, arrested uh, for some uh, dubious reason. Um, so this is a kind of spatial distribution of, of white supremacist ideology and we can assume bait behaviors that include violence of different sorts. And, and, and what the social science research has shown over and over again is if we can scale out from this city level um, picture and understand national patterns of um, of, uh, of both sort of the con concentrations of racialized violence and their impacts over time. So just to illustrate that point, I'll show you this 1961 map uh, using 1960 data to illustrate the percent of the county population enslaved in the 1860, according to the 1860 census. And also, um, yeah, to, hammer down a little more on this point about precedent at times. I'm gonna uh, highlight Tuskegee, Alabama, one of many places we could highlight, but I wanna highlight Tuskegee because this is where the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, as it was called, began in 1932 and continued until 1972, 40 year uh, study that involved um, essentially scientific racism that was meant to kind of glean insights about medicine and disease through um, 
uh, this sort of uh, permitted suffering of, of African Americans. Um, here we see a US public health worker uh, conduct, conducting, engaging, and collecting blood um, from African American subject in the this, in this, in this study in Macon County. And you know, today we are among the many challenges we face is this global pandemic and the challenge of undoing the, uh, uh, figuring out how do we counter the legitimate distrust of the medical profession of government um, by African-Americans and other people of color who have been subject to uh, 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 this kind of racialized violence. And I'm gonna use the term racial violence to talk about a number of different forms of violence. Uh, but to be clear, I wanna point out that in a racially, in a society organized by the idea of race, racial violence is a constant. It is not an episodic thing. It is a constant, but it is variable in form. It is structural in form. Uh, that is how the, the society is organized to provide for the needs of some, the interests of some members versus others, like the health system. Uh, it is cultural in form, racial violence operating in the context of constructions of meanings and, and monuments are key here. And it is corporeal in form or bodily or direct in form, uh, racial violence. Uh, and, and we see a, an illustration of that here as well. The, um, the sort of uh, point of, uh, of you know, harming the body, diminishing uh, uh, prospects for a full life, for example, or contributing to premature death. Um, so another interesting thing about Tuskegee and so many of the story histories I'm gonna share with you is that um, in some ways, you know, the specifics of the study don't matter anymore. In public memory, it is representative. The Tuskegee experiment is representative of a whole body of of injustices that have been perpetrated um, uh, by the state. Uh, and, and they sort of, um, you know, blend together, bleed together in a, a, a sort of, you know, a kind of omnibus skepticism or distrust of, or uh, a sort of degradation of the legitimacy of the state. And we have inherited that history today uh, in, for example, the context of, um, uh, well, you know, I was going to say um, reluctance to, uh, patterns of reluctance to be, to, re to receive a vaccine for COVID-19, but I should also point out we've inherited that structure in the form of what seems to be uh, the disparate uh, distribution of vaccine uh, in, our, in our country and, and the story was repeated around the world. Uh, it is not a coincidence that the Tuskegee experiment happens in Tuskegee, Alabama. Uh, we, we know from a growing body of work that there are these kind of cascading dynamics of racialized violence over time that relate in part to histories of slavery in the United States. And I'll share some findings from a recent study uh, in the Journal of Politics that showed that the proportion of, in, in, a portion of the population enslaved in 1860, which is indicated by the shading on this map, is uh, positively related to, now these aren't, these aren't just kind of correlations um, by variate analysis. These, these are, multi, this is a robust multivariate study that shows net of other factors. Uh, the rate of lynching decades after uh, abolition is positively related to the percent of the population enslaved in 1860. Study found that support for liberal, liberal government, you know, candidates for office who ran on um, liberal uh, platforms uh, is consistently negatively related to the proportion enslaved. In other words, in counties where a higher proportion of the population was enslaved in 1860, white populations in particular, uh, these attitudinal studies, attitudinal variables are looking particularly at white attitudes and behaviors. Um, white voters were much less likely to support liberal governments um, consistently over generations over this incredible span of time. 
support for affirmative action negatively related, levels of racial resentment positively related in the 2000s to the percent enslaved in 1860 at the county level. So this is being, dem this is being observed consistently over generations, if you look at these time scales, among white Americans in communities historically dependent on slave-based economies compared to whites in neighboring areas where there was less or no dependence on uh, slavery as measured by the percentage of population enslaved. And that's an imperfect measure, but this is a really compelling story. And, and you know, and I was, I was, when I first started learning about this research, I was pretty uh, stunned to learn how uh, robust these relationships appear to be. And this literature has really grown substantially over the past decade. My co colleagues and I have been contributing to the basic research in this area. And I can talk about one or two of those studies in a moment, but I just want to lay out uh, some examples of patterns that have been observed related to legacies of racial violence, most often measured, racial violence measured by histories of enslavement and lynching at the county level. So contemporary white political conservatism, the mobilization of white supremacists today, perhaps not the Ku Klux Klan, but Proud Boys, uh, neo-Nazi, neo-Confederate groups, et cetera. Patterns of residential segregation, support for the death penalty. Our most, one of our most recent studies, we found that um, whites are less vulnerable to opioid related deaths in counties distinguished by histories of, uh, of enslavement. And, and happy to talk more about that in the conversation. But the list goes on and on. You know, black homicide rates, black victim homicide rates are, have been one of the most closely studied um, phenomena. And, uh, and uh, it, it's been demonstrated numerous times that histories of lynching predict patterns of black victim homicide. And there are a couple of caveats there I'm going to come back to. Um, a recent study we published in the journal Social Problems showed that every additional lynching in the history of a county pretty dramatically increases the odds today that any child in the 11 southern states we study will be corporally punished in schools, but particularly Black children. And this is, again, net of other factors. So taking account of the uh, the level of funding in the school, the experience level of the teachers, the racial composition of the schools, and so many other factors. Lynching is a pretty strong predictor of the odds that uh, children and particularly younger black children will be corporally punished in schools today. And these are complicated relationships uh, in terms of the mechanisms underlying them. Uh, I'll just summarize what, what are some of the th dynamics, institutional, cultural, uh, psychological, other factors, material uh, believed to be at work. Estrangement is uh, a key idea. So think about black victim homicide again, or also corporal punishment. Uh, researchers suggest that uh, in places distinguished by histories of racial violence, there has been this systematic estrangement of the um, uh, repressed population that uh, that uh, become separated from uh, law, from medicine, from the economy, estranged from, distrustful of, um, not, not represented by. And thus, in response to that, there are the self-help mechanisms that are adopted, like not calling police to resolve disputes, but rather resolving them yourself. And in a, in a, in a nation where there is such easy access to lethal weapons, this uh, easily translates into higher rates of, of homicide in those uh, contexts. The loss of community and the collective efficacy that is created by community is an important factor, material accumulation, disaccumulation patterns. And I've been really interested in the, um, um, these last two points, which are, they, these are not mutually exclusive ideas. They're all bound up with each other, but this is, um, the, the, the cyclical or cascading nature of racialized violence, how it continues over time and place within and across time and place. So specific places, I'll show you an example of this in a moment, being inundated over time, uh, but also people being displaced and, and often by racist violence, moving to another place where they experience another form of it. And we'll use St. Louis as an example of that in a moment. Um, 
and, and finally, this, uh, the, the concept of intergenerational trauma and haunting is uh, an important one here. It, maybe we could uh, talk more about, but I wanted to show you this, um, this, this uh, map, this flag uh, as an illustration of a number of these ideas. This is a flag being a popular flag, apparently the bestseller Hawkins footwear advertised in 2019. It is the Confederate battle flag remixed as a Blue Lives Matter or I Love the Police flag. And, uh, and, and so it is, it is kind of uh, essentially blending ideas about uh, the lost cause of the South, the noble cause of the South, uh, white pride and uh, you know, white supremacy and, uh, and the legitimacy of the of, of the of the of the state, and particularly the police. I want to note, but you know, this Hawkins Footwear store. I looked up; it's an online. You know, they have an online shop, but they, the actual store is in Georgia, about five miles from where Ahmad Aubrey was shot by, uh, was killed. Some uh, described lynched by uh, white vigilantes uh, recently. And so this is an example of our of a racist political culture, a, a symbol of a racist political culture that is still rooted in the past, uh, but very much present. So there are these kind of circulations of racialized violence in its various forms, structural, cultural, corporeal. I was going to a meeting in Alabama a couple of years ago in Birmingham where police were trying to reconcile, reckon with their complicity in the history of racist repression in that city. Um, reckon with community members trying to build trust and communicate and, co and cooperation. And I, I was just doing some research before I went down and get a sense of what was going on. And one of the early, first things I found was this article in the, in the uh, Guardian newspaper about waste from New York being shipped by train to Alabama uh, where it was stored in places like Uniontown, Alabama. Um, so you had feces and other human waste from New York being stored in, uh, in, in Alabama in a 99% black town in Alabama called Uniontown that was established as a free, essentially as a, um, a free town by blacks who escaped um, uh, repression in other parts of the uh, uh, state nearby Selma, for example. Um, and in Uniontown, uh, where their political power is quite limited, they are vulnerable to the siting of a hazardous waste uh, dump site. And, 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 and to, to, just to point, just to emphasize this point about cascades, the human waste uh, was added on top of other kinds of hazardous waste like coal ash. Uh, the coal ash coming from a 90% white community in uh, Tennessee where there was a coal mine. And, uh, and so the white community in Tennessee is, is benefiting from this economic uh, development and the mining and so forth, but moving its waste to 90% black Union Town, uh, uh, in this kind of compounding stew of uh, 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 of harmful uh, uh, of harmful uh, exposures. Now, this is you might say, you know, this is an example of a how structural, cultural, and corporeal violence combine. The cultural, in part, being the trivialization of black life that makes it possible to rationalize uh, the selective exposure of a population uh, 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 to this kind of suffering, um, or it makes it possible, that makes their suffering illegible, uh, it legitimizes it. Uh, the last image here is from an anti-slavery uh, publication in 1845 about the common mode of whipping with the paddle which is also demonstrating um, its uh, racial politics. Uh, but I mentioned that corporal punishment is predicted by histories of lynching. So you, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas are by far the most frequent uh, uh, 
places where corporal punishment in schools is most common. Uh, and that exists along with uh, the other kinds of uh, racialized violence uh, that have, I've described in the example of Uniontown. It is also the case that racialized violence does not, and its impact does not remain uh, fixed in particular places. And that this point is made for us, uh, well, illustrated, I would say, the article doesn't uh, do it, but the St. Louis Post-Dispatch article from 1903 describing the, uh, describing the displacement of the entire black population of, of uh, West Plain, Missouri through a, uh, through threats of racial terror uh, lynching. And, and specifically what was threatened here, which is telling, this is 1903, white residents resentful of the economic pros prosperity told the black residents they must leave town immediately, leaving everything behind. Uh, um, and if they did not, they would kill all the adults and they would sell their children into slavery uh, in 1903. So this is a, example of what I was describing earlier as an inheritance of structure, uh, including the, lo the, the, the logic that we can still own you, we can still sell you uh, decades after emancipation. One of the things that really attracted me to St. Louis and to Washington University was to, to the opportunity to come to the Mississippi River Valley. And um, this is a, a kind of social ecological environment where legacies of racial violence are quite concentrated and where I think there's tremendous opportunity to engage in um, redress. Uh, uh, but uh, one of, just to make this point about the concentration of harm, uh, I'm gonna just scroll through these selective examples of pogroms in US history uh, and uh, anti-black pogroms in, in US history. <laughs> My, uh, I, I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> um, and populations displaced and, uh, in parentheses you muted yourself that was good I could tell my son he needed to leave me alone while I was muted um, so in parentheses, we see the numbers of people displaced, oftentimes the entire population. And, and where are they going? They're, they're migrating in many cases to cities um, farther north uh, and uh, east and west. And uh, it, you know this long list of cases, many of which I'm sure the audience has never heard of in terms of you know, these atrocities. Um, uh, many of them occur in areas that are quite proximate to each other, like this series of events in, in, in southwest Missouri and Pierce City and Monette and uh, Springfield are happening within years of each other, displacing in many cases uh, the same people who are being routinely uprooted uh, and uh, required to start over somewhere else. St. Louis being a major transportation hub inevitably become, becomes a place where there is a kind of sedimentation of the harm uh, that accrues through this, uh, through this history of racist violence. And then people get to St. Louis and they encounter something like this, uh, the, uh, the apartheid uh, policy regarding residential segregation in 1916, which I, by the way, just on the point of precedent at times, I'll uh, note, um, occurs in uh, proximity to another pandemic uh, that would disproportionately impact African-Americans and other people of color in places like St. Louis. Um, and, uh, and so these are really, you know, I think important landscape backstories and the, in the in monumental anti-racism I'm gonna to talk to um, in the next section is really trying to grapple with these. I mean, and, you know, anti-racist memory work is often trying to grapple with these histories and their legacies. Before I get to that, I just want to say a little bit about this idea of structural inheritance. And I make this plural because we all inherit, we all inherit structures of inequality. 
rooted in histories of violence, in, in histories of violence, but our inheritances are not the same. Um, I'm using this map of St. Louis, and I like this map because it is sort of ambiguous. And if we had time, I would do a, we could do a poll and just ask people what they think these dots are. Um, and the, the reality is that probably many of the answers would be correct. Uh, uh, what they are literally are brownfields or former industrial commercial sites where future use is, uh, that where they're uh, sites that are contaminated, environmentally contaminated, or believed to be that, uh, restrict their potential for productive use today. And again, on the point of cascades, you know, when I moved here, my wife and I moved here, uh, the realtors were quick to tell us about schools and, uh, and gave us this interesting map. Uh, and I've just reproduced it here, showing the scores for schools in St. Louis on a zero scale of zero to 10, 10 being the best. Um, and, and I'm just gonna, you know, showing you this because it illustrates uh, compounding harms, uh, ecological, structural, that have uh, uh, pr profound implications for things like um, uh, child development and future economic uh, political prospects of an entire group if a group is, select is selectively exposed to these kinds of uh, deprivations. The idea of structural inheritance I draw upon comes from uh, Michael Rothberg, comparative literature scholar at UCLA, who wrote, wrote a wonderful book recently called The Implicated Subject, where he's pushing us to think beyond this binary of victims and perpetrators. Um, Rothberg is a Holocaust memory scholar in particular. But you know we have these kind of binaries of victims and perpetrators. We take something like slavery, uh, you know, who were the perpetrators and who were the victims? Um, and Rothberg's point, point, book point illustrates that this is a unproductive and inaccurate way of thinking about our relationship to the past. He's arguing that we are all essentially implicated subjects. Uh, we live enmeshed in structures, institutions, and webs of ideas that are the products of history. And we are implicated in them in the sense that they cause us. So the way that we, for example, people identify our identities today are partly rooted in these webs of ideas and structures and institutions that have created these identities, these self-concepts, uh, if you will. And we, can, we, we have uh, inherited that we've, we've embodied them and we reproduce them uh, in our uh, behaviors. And we, um, you know, this is a, just an example of structural inheritance a uh, black cab driver describes his experience in Charleston, South Carolina in 2017. Um, uh, his experience of disrespect uh, when he drives around this, this monument venerating a white supremacist. He says, I feel like I'm being spit upon as, uh, you know, as I imagine an enslaved person would have felt uh, walking down the street when they were subject to similar kinds of abuse. So, uh, so I'm sharing this image here in part to begin to get into this reckoning with monuments. Here's another monument uh, example it, that has been subject to a kind of reinterpretation, if you will, in the form of vandalism. Um, and, and what that vandalism has done is activate this monument in a way that it was not activated uh, previously, I would venture to guess that these two uh, girls would not be looking at it uh, in this photograph were it uh, undisturbed. Uh, they might not have even really taken any time at all to take stock of it, but this anti-racist intervention is inviting them to consider their structural inheritance as implicated subjects. So we live enmeshed in these structures, these girls' identities, their sense of self, how they've learned to talk about race, for example, is rooted in this inheritance. Uh, and I should say how they learn not to talk about race. Uh, we don't talk about race. It's probably what's so part of what's really interesting, I would imagine, to them about this object is that it is so explicitly about race uh, in a political culture where they've learned that we don't talk about race. It's an, it's an appropriate topic uh, in the context of colorblindness, et cetera. 
So this implication is, is derived from our structural position in relation to groups, how we are positioned in relation to groups and classes and modes of production that makes some of us beneficiaries. Uh, you know, we are endowed by this inheritance, uh, a history not our own. Uh, you know, we didn't own slaves and yet uh, there is this endowment and others are disadvantaged by, uh, regardless of their genealogical connection to the past, a person of African descent who moves to the United States tomorrow will inherit this web of structures and institutions and ideas um, and will be implicated in them uh, in the sense that their life chances will be to some extent uh, conditioned by them. So I've, I've been really interested in, you know, how, if, if we accept this idea of structural inheritance how do we disinherit this uh, structures of inequality rooted in histories of racist violence? I think a basic idea here is, is that we have to process historical trauma. We have to sit with it. We have to um, integrate it within our culture, within our structures. Um, and there are efforts to do that, of course. And, uh, um, and, that, and, and I do think we are in unprecedented times as that effort goes, as the sort of willingness to acknowledge this history and legacy goes and the willingness to uh, engage in some reckoning. Gabriel Schwab, another Holocaust scholar whose amazing book, Haunting Legacies, um, been very helpful to me, uh, writes about how trauma that is not processed, that is not worked through and integrated uh, gets passed on to the next generation. And when this happens, the next generation, just think about those girls in the previous slide for just for um, discussion's sake, the next generation will inherit the psychic substance of the previous generation and display symptoms that do not emerge from their own individual experience. For example, being afraid of black people had no individual experience that gives them reason to fear, be fearful. And yet they have inherited this parents or relatives or community psychic conflicts, traumata or secrets, uh, becoming haunted by the ghosts or which she calls the unfinished business of a previous generation. Uh, I think the work in the humanities in, um, in the sciences and medicine, you know, the work that psychoanalysts are doing around trauma. I'm excited. You know, I think we, we haven't gotten yet to the point where the social sciences are integrating those insights in their terms of their modeling of these relationships. Uh, but we're moving in that direction. And the and there is some promising evidence that uh, that we can in fact disinherit. Uh, this structure to some extent and diminish its continued, uh, diminish uh, the continued impact of this series of racist violence. This, is, this, um, this graphic is from a recent publication in sociology journal that showed that the relationship between lynching in the past and homicide, black victim homicide in the present is attenuated by, is, is mediated by extent to which um, populations resist intergenerational transmission of white supremacist ideology and racist structures. And their measure of that resistance is very specific. It was whether people voted, whites voted in large numbers um, for uh, candidates who ran on explicitly racist platforms. And unfortunately, we could still replicate that study through our most recent elections. Uh, and probably uh, for some time to come. But what they found is that in counties where whites did not vote for, they were looking at Strom Thurmond and George Wallace, where in counties where whites, in counties with histories of lynching, where whites did not re-up on white supremacy by supporting those candidates, the relationship between lynching and black victim homicide today was weakened. So this is, I think, some encouraging evidence that, uh, that the social body, uh, if we think about this legacy story as a kind of ep epidemiological sense, as a kind of condition that is passed on, potentially kind of metastasized in the social body, it is some evidence that the body might be capable of uh, some healing. 
And this is what people I think are trying to do right now in their reckoning with uh, the commemorative landscape and specifically their reckoning with the, uh, the problem of white supremacy on the commemorative landscape through all kinds of amazing creative uh, practices like what we see here, the projection of light onto this uh, uh, statue to produce other uh, sort of valuational claims um, to, uh, and to counter the, the narrative of the, of the Confederate monument itself. Um, you know, what's happening to these people in the picture who are taking the photo, I wonder, what, uh, how is their sense of self and other shifting? You know, what I mean by monumental anti-racism is, is a pretty straightforward, you know, anti-racism being this kind of active commitment to fighting racism, wherever you find it, including yourself. And the idea of monumental being on the one hand, a notion of scale and on the other being about memory. Um, sociologically, I'm really interested in this first part of the monumental definition. Uh, what counts as a uh, memory work that is great in importance, extent or size? And how will we know that? Uh, how will we know what this uh, commemorative reckoning does, what, it, what impact it, it has? And, and, and I imagine some, some interventions will have more impact than others. And why will that, what, what will be the kind of um, uh, distinguishing factors of those most impactful, most important interventions? That's something I'm trying to work with colleagues now to, uh, to study. I, I do want to stress though that anti-racist memory work, first of all, is not new and it is ubiquitous in form. So a lot of great example comes from Shannon Mattern in her fantastic article, Fugitive Libraries, where she writes about how black leaders created libraries historically, like the Schomburg Library picture atop here, um, as kinds of monuments and, and not so much as places to preserve the past, but really to ensure the future, uh, to monuments ensuring the future of the group. One of these leaders she, uh, she quotes in their article says that there are all of these different ways that black folks have been archiving for centuries because we've been very much aware of the possibility of someone saying that we never existed. And in fact, this is what the landscape often says or our history books often say. Um, my book, The Black Child Savers has that strange title in part because it is a response to a famous book called The Child Savers that should have been called The White Child Savers, but it was this kind of generalized account of the white experience that I was countering in my book, uh, centering African-American, uh, the African-American experience. The bottom image is a intellectual history of, um, of ideas in music and texts uh, related to uh, uh, the, uh, that's produced by the Chimarenga Library on Circulations. Um, so libraries are, are sites of memory work and they're not, and they're not, uh, they don't only work in the way we think of libraries working. Uh, this mobile library from segregated North Carolina is an example of anti-racist memory work. Of, um, this contemporary image from a Brooklyn sidewalk of the free black women's library where um, a resident of Brooklyn put all her black feminist work out on the street and said to people, borrow it, read it, uh, take something if it's interesting to you, bring it back when you're done and take something else. Um, this Black Lives Matter Wikipedia thought, edit a thon is a, an example of anti-racist memory work in the digital uh, context. Political philosopher Charles Mills writes, I think, uh, about the importance of anti-racist memory work when he identifies the epistemological foundation of white supremacism and what he calls the racial contract. The epistemological dimension being this white agreement to routinely misinterpret the world, to misrecognize reality. Uh, and he says, quote, that white misunderstanding, misrepresentation, invasion, and self-deception on matters related to race are pervasive over the past several hundred years. Again, not unprecedented because uh, it is required. This is required, a cognitive and moral economy 
psychically required to rationalize conquest, colonization, enslavement, apartheid, uh, the profound inequality in our society today requires this work of misunderstanding what my colleague in political science calls, uh, Clarissa Hayward calls motivated ignorance. Um, I'm gonna skip through this quickly because I wanna, I'm mindful of the time, but I'm gonna wrap up soon. But, um, you know, there's an article in the ampersand, uh, Washu's ampersand that was, came out, I think yesterday, talking of describing the racial violence archive and, um, and a bus tour. I was invited to join as a scholar in residence by the Jewish Community Relations Council and the Archdiocese of St. Louis. It was an amazing trip. But I'm thinking about going on this bus tour. I was, th you know, I was thinking, you know, uh, the article doesn't say this, but we're, honestly, I was thinking, I don't want to stand up on the bus the whole time and, and be pointing out the window, like, you know, terrible things happen there, and terrible things happen there, and, and there's a social movement over there. Uh, so I was thinking, you know, how do I, how do I create a resource for uh, these fellow travelers that will activate sites of conscience that will be moving through, in part to dis disrupt the idea that we need to go all the way down to Montgomery, Alabama to um, understand uh, racial violence and its legacy. And that this group is particularly interested in mass incarceration. So I created this digital uh, triptych, I called it, you know, old enough to remember triple A's printed triptychs and where I tried to activate the commemorative landscape um, uh, by showing people where, you know, we're moving, going to St. Louis down to Memphis and then or we, we're showing people uh, what we know about histories of racist violence in the counties we're driving through, showing people where there are Confederate monuments on courthouse grounds that are degrading equal protection under law. Um, showing people where the prisons are that have been part of our incredible boom in incarceration and particularly racialized mass incarceration. Um, so this was an attempt to really use digital scholarship to engage, um, uh, to facilitate an understanding of, our, of this point about structural inheritance. I'm really excited by, inspired by the work that artists have done in this space. And I would argue that the artist, artist, artist community has been at the forefront of our uh, increasing grappling with histories and legacies of racial violence. This is an example from Sonia Clark's work, uh, uh, exhibition called Unraveling and Unraveled, where she had Confederate battle flags, a uh, Confederate battle flag in the museum and invited visitors to take it apart, thread by thread, uh, in part to demonstrate the difficulty of dismantling this thing uh, and, uh, and to build community and to, and, to, and to build through the performative element, a, a, a sense of a sort of affective component to it. Um, uh, so this memory work I think is critical and, 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 and and can be liberating um, for whites. And, and this is to be clear, not the end game. The point is not to liberate whites, but if we can help contemporary white Americans process this historical trauma, including their implication in it by facilitating acknowledgement of the actions of their ancestors or those who acted in their name, even if they were not their own genealogical ancestors, you know, uh, those who acted in their name uh, uh, and it helped them separate those actions from their own modern identities and thus their contemporary behaviors. I think this is the real promise of anti-racist memory work. Another of Sonia Clark's and my last illustration, uh, another of her works that I think is just incredibly profound, it's very simple, is the uh, work to make the Confederate flag of truce more known to the American population. And this work, this exhibit is called Monumental Cloth, a Flag We Should Know. You know, people have not seen the, uh, the truce flag, but this is of course the flag that is most important to our, um, uh, to our republic, 
uh, and to the extent we continue to have a union, you know, I was thinking I was going to show some images of the Confederate battle flag and the Capitol, you know, the other day when the uh, racist storm the Capitol. Um, but, uh, but, you know, imagine instead that this flag were framed in um, our nation's capital as a um, as an important kind of material, an important cultural artifact related to uh, our uh, uh, this uh, the pursuit of freedom in this country, and again in this exhibit, Sonia Clark um, does developed an interactive participatory dimension so that visitors could really be more connected to the ideas and the work of uh, the reparative and, and more connected to the reparative memory work itself. Uh, this is a photo of me at one of the looms Sonia Clark had set up in the museum so that people could make more Confederate fl truce flags, um, uh, which, which can be you know, distributed and shared and, uh, and so forth as, a, as part of her effort to um, shift how we remember the Civil War, how we remember the Confederacy uh, and its continued meaning today. So I'll leave you with this uh, image from the National Memorial to Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, where our bus ended up. Of course, one of the most important examples of monumental anti-racism currently in our country. And also with the point that um, while it is true that we cannot change the past, it is critical that we intervene in its present and future meaning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Jeff, um, for your talk and for giving us all a lot to think about. Um, we have um, several questions and I invite um, other people to add their questions to the Q&A. Um, I think we'll start with a question from Margaret Galindo. Uh, the question is, in your opinion, what are the most pressing ghosts and traumas that haunt academia or wash you specifically? Uh, well, I guess I would say generally, as someone I've been teaching now at universities, I've been at, taught at many, several universities, but uh, and this isn't specific to Wash U, but generally speaking, I've been struck by how, um, you know, I used to teach in the University of California system and I had much larger, a much larger university, UC Irvine, I had, I was teaching criminology and justice, studies, uh, criminology and law and society, I would have a hundred students in a class. And there was just profound disparity between the students and the extent to which they had access prior to that point uh, to educational opportunity, um, you know, really committed students who had struggles, you know, were struggling with uh, writing and uh, reading comprehension and just uh, other things that other students in the same class, um, uh, it just was a breeze. And so this is an example of how our educational structures uh, produce. I have, you saw my six-year-old who made a cameo, you know, beginning with uh, uh, prenatal care and early child, uh, early um, childhood care, um, high quality daycare, on through the every school level, we get, we get this um, pattern of, of compounding inequality vis-a-vis -vis the accumulation that one part of the population enjoys vis-a-vis -vis its access to better resources in those respects, uh, more respect, more protection, and uh, the disaccumulation others experience. And universities like WashU or UC Irvine cannot undo that. Uh, I mean, we can, we can certainly intervene in it, um, but we can't change that past, right? We can intervene in its present and future meaning as my last point made. So that's a general point about the in response to that question, I think is important. Um, and this is, you know, this is relates to the black child savers, which is, which is really largely about how the Jim Crow juvenile justice system cast into the future, 
um, black economic, political, social disadvantages by limiting black youth's potential for self-realization. Um, and, and so we continue to live with that today. The, the injuries happening today with young people in our community will be carried forward uh, over time. The other thing I wanna say about WashU though, and mentioned related to this talk is that um, Washington University, I think will soon join the 75 or so universities across five countries that are engaged in this uh, initiative called University Studying Slavery. And we will be, I'm a part of the working group that has been developing the plan for our approach there, our first phase of that approach. And we will begin to really probe the question that the, um, part of the question the person asked by looking at um, the institution's relationship to the history of slavery and, uh, and how, we, how we should understand that legacy uh, today as um, various parts of our academic mission go. Uh, and, and, and ultimately what I'm most interested in is on that foundation of understanding, what do we then do? And I think University College is, a, is an important part of that story. Um, because it has a kind of nimbleness to it that allows, I think, for some circumventing of some of the obstacles that uh, otherwise often exist as re research universities, for example, try to kind of um, wade into these legacies and um, promote redress. So th hopefully there'll be more about that to come soon. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from um, Jane Perry Scott, how can we combat the idea of white supremacy when many whites inherently believe they are indeed superior? Is there a quote reality where you think things can and will change? Um, yeah, I appreciate the question. It is a vexing issue. You know, I agree. Um, I grew up, you know, I was thinking about this. I don't remember why I, I agreed to write something about my I'm getting old now, you know, people starting to ask me to write like biographical, like retrospectives. It's like, <laughs> but I was thinking about writing this thing and I was, and I was thinking I'm gonna call it, what are you? Uh, because this is a question I've been so often asked in my life because of my race ambiguity, uh, phenotypically, you know, people have always wanted to locate me in the matrix of racial meaning. And, um, and so it's, a. I start there because it's an illustration of just how deeply um, woven into our social fabric, the idea of white supremacy is. And, um, and you know, like the, you know, the idea that certain hair is good and bad and uh, light skin privilege that I, you know, privy to. But, but to get more directly to the question of whiteness and, you know, I, I think there is, some hope in um, the possibility that, um, well, let me put it this way. I think in some ways the answer is about, is, 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 is a class consciousness issue. And uh, one of the ways the white supremacist ideology has worked as a kind of foil, and Charles Mills talked about the, I mentioned the epistemological dimension, but he also talks about the political and moral dimensions of the racial contract. Uh, the vast majority of white Americans historically have been sold a kind of bill of goods that says you'll be better off in this system of, of apartheid where you enjoy this kind of dignitary privilege. You know, uh, But the fact is that many white Americans, the majority of white Americans don't fare well in our social system. Um, they, they have interests that are more in common with uh, working class and poor, lower middle class people of color in terms of things like um, affordable housing and, um, and uh, health care and um, gun control. And you know the list just goes on and on. Uh, I mean, the, the environment. I mean, we, we all have this. So, so I think if there, if, you know, I'm thinking about books, you know, work recently, like um, Jonathan Metzl's book that got a lot of attention, Dying of Whiteness. Uh, uh, he's a, a you know, 
medical uh, school professor at Vanderbilt, and he showed that 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 white political behavior rooted in uh, racism is contributing to premature death among white Americans. And he uses uh, opposition to healthcare reform, uh, opposition to gun control, and um, opposition to educational opportunity, you know, the expansion of educational opportunity to demonstrate this in that study. Uh, so I think if we can if we if we can talk more about harm in a in an expansive kind of capacious way, it's possible that people will uh, come to understand the sort of um, uh, illusion of white supremacy and also the illusion that reinvestment and sustaining the investment in white supremacist ideology is in their interest, you know, that they'll continue to benefit from that. I think we need to counter that. And that's largely a class, I think a class issue as well. Okay, our next question comes from um, Gary uh, Meltz. Do you believe Confederate monuments should be dismantled or is it just trying to rewrite history? Well, let me let me uh, reverse the question. So, uh, I think the monuments themselves rewrite history, and you know I was going to show this. There's this great uh, editorial that Frederick Douglass wrote about. This is not about a Confederate monument, but it's the same point holds about the Liberty Monument, which you've, many of you've probably seen with Abraham Lincoln and a, um, a depiction of a formerly enslaved person who is kind of on his knees, shackles broken. Um, and, and he writes about the dishonesty of the monument itself, uh, where, for example, that if we're gonna praise the people who, the person who uh, enfranchised African-Americans, there should be mention of of, of Ulysses S. Grant, uh, uh, it's it not really about Lincoln. Uh, it, you know, in terms of the empowerment of African Americans historically, and so that monument, that narrative, is itself a, a kind of selective representation of a reality. And they've all they're all selective in their representation. No monument is ever comprehensive in its representation of the past. They are artistic renderings of a of of, of a past. So I think we have to we have to just get away to disabuse ourselves of the idea that there is this truth on the landscape now, and people want to kind of rewrite it or, or do a revision of history. They are already revisionist in their in nature. Um, the other point, though, is, the first part of the question is that um, thing I want to say about that is I think it's very important that that we are thoughtful about these places, sites as arenas with some utility. And so, um, so the, the arena idea, you know, people write about monuments, describe them as arenas. They are places that create, uh, they are places charged with meaning that thereby create a space for people to have discourse about important ideas like racism or um, sexism, uh, you know, inequality. Um, and so I, I think what we should try to do is find ways to activate those arenas in productive ways. And, and you know, in some cases, objects should be removed um, I, mean, I think a clear case of that is Confederate monuments on courthouse grounds, right? This is, or other state institutional sites, because this is a symbolic and I think substantive degradation of the idea, the very idea of equal protection under law. Um, uh, in many other contexts though, I think it might be more productive to recontextualize objects and to retain the arena, but to build into it more interpretive content um, uh, to invite more reflection 
you know, and we saw this activation of the arena and that Louisville sculpture uh, statue where the, the girls were walking by. It became, you know, it was turned into a kind of civics education space and a place for them, I think, to productively think about the ideas that are embedded in the monument and more productively than before the vandalism. Uh, uh, so, so I think that's a big challenge and we're, you know, I'm one of the things my, I teach a class called Monumental Anti-Racism where my students and I, um, uh, I ask students to propose commemorative interventions and one of them has begun working on the Olympic rings on WashU's campus, just to go back to the previous question a little bit as well. You know, these Olympic rings celebrating the 1904 Olympics are silent about the incredible racism of those games, the way that they were designed as a sort of pseudo-scientific experiment in, in, um, uh, to, to demonstrate white superiority vis-a-vis -vis what were called the anthropology days uh, that were played there where natives unquote, were pitted against normal white people. And um, it was a spectacle, it was a racist spectacle. And, and, and so how do we, what do we do then with the rings? Do we remove them? I think it would be more productive, particularly at, a, at, at an educational institution to build into that landscape, something like a mural that complicates the story or um, uh, some other uh, uh, commemoration of uh, the athletes who played there, um, the, the sort of, uh, that, that would trouble the history of those games on our campus but in a way that would be productive as the liberal arts mission of the university goes as sort of expansive thinking. And, you know, we're committed as a university to training students who will be leaders in solving some of our nation's most and our world's most pressing problems. Uh, uh, racism is one of them. So how do we make that site part of that uh, extra and co-curricular kind of commitment? Uh, our next question is from Elizabeth Springfield, and she says, how do the slavery, KKK, maps, et cetera, relate to more recent disenfranchised movements by state legislatures? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think they relate, well, most, direct, most directly they relate, you know, one of the studies I didn't, I didn't include in my laundry list of findings um, is, um, vote suppression. So studies, uh, there's an economist at, I forget where she is, I think Brookings, somewhere else, uh, who's published, whose research has shown that uh, histories of racial violence, and I forget how she measured that, are related to vote suppression um, in uh, the contemporary United States, vote suppression being measured by the, the disparity in uh, voter registration and participation across counties. So, uh, to go back to the, uh, the mechanisms point I was making, you know, how does this work? Uh, one one way we suspect this works is through this um, point of estrangement I was making. So that, uh, on the one hand. Uh, uh, populations that have been subject to race, racist violence and, you know, again, of, of all sorts, structural, cultural, corporeal, um, are distrust, distrustful of the state, um, uh, uh, see the state as like, lacking legitimacy, unlikely to represent their interests. And the state itself has demonstrated that in those places, as we've seen. And so too has the white polity we show, you know, showed you know, white, white populations in those same places have routinely opposed liberal governments, um, things like affirmative action. Uh, they have opposed um, uh, policies that would have benefited uh, people of color. So there is a story of estrangement that is passed on and on. And I think it also, it, it really shapes the political map and calculus that contemporary politicians draw upon, like our own Senator Hawley, for example, who's determined 
apparently that it is strategically um, it was in it was a, a good move strategically to align himself with uh, this attempt to overturn our recent election, an attempt that is imbued with uh, uh, this kind of racist ideology about the country, this being a white country, you know, the Proud Boys and so on, um, and 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 to some extent, uh, it's. It's, an, it's probably an accurate strategic interpretation in a state like Missouri, uh, where there is um, uh, so much disdain for, uh, you know, people in St. Louis, uh, particularly people of uh, black people in St. Louis, for example, or for the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, the, you know, so so how it relates, I mean, it's a really obviously a complicated relationship over time, but I think that hopefully I've given some indications of the ways we know this, we know that the pattern exists and we believe the mechanisms include uh, uh, some of those uh, things like estrangement, like extreme racial socialization, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and I, I don't think there's any need to emphasize how evident it is that we have politicians still today, I mentioned only one of them, who um, continue to run on this platform of, uh, of kind of keeping America white. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Shug Goodlow. Um, Shug says, I am a clergy person, a clergy person involved in anti-racism work in predominantly or exclusively white churches here in St. Louis. It is nearly always suggested that the name of the work and associated committees be changed to something, quote, less polarizing. It has uh, even been suggested that the term anti-racism is actually code for Black Lives Matter. Your thoughts, please. <laughs> wow. Black lives do matter is my first thought. You know, it's, uh, you know I mean, uh, and, People are just, you know, I, I think, I think uh, it's a, it's. I appreciate the question, you know, and I appreciate the struggle, um, you know, the reality of the struggle, and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm smiling because, you know, um, the idea that Black Lives Matter is polarizing is, is just, uh, it's exhausting, it's absurd, but. Um, but I understand where it comes from. It comes from a place where people have been, uh, have read this as this kind of terroristic, I mean, it's crazy to me, this like, you know, the Black Lives Matter mob and the terrorists, I mean, all this kind of infective, you know, around the, the, that movement that is quite absurd when you look at the, um, the reality of its manifestations, its, its expression, um, the peacefulness of its uh, expression by and large, certainly in contrast to the I guess we'll call the White Lives Matter movement. Um, uh, but but the thing about Black Lives Matter, I think part, first of all, that maybe maybe have some. I, I, it might be it just may be impossible. Um, but but to again re, to just kind of reinforce the point that the Black Lives Matter movement is about the trivialization of Black life within the ideology of white supremacy. It is countering that narrative that black lives don't matter, that we saw result in things like the Tuskegee experiment um, that has contributed to this atrocity of mass incarceration that we just live comfortably with because we have grown comfortable with the uh, trivialization of black life and life prospects. Um, I, all that being said, I think it is um, important to work with people kind of where they are and try to move together to um, places that might be more productive. And so, you know, I, I, I don't know if it was in this presentation or not, but I, I rarely use the word reparations um, when I talk about this work, though it is obviously salient. And I avoid it because it is so charged in our culture and people don't understand it. Um, afraid of it, they think someone's gonna come and take their house, you know, and, and all that. So I, I avoid that distraction by using another word like repair, 
Um, and uh, which, and they're all fraught words. I mean, repair, you know, I get pushed back from my progressive you know, radical friends who are like, repair what? It's not broken, this is how it's supposed to work. Uh, you know, uh, but anyway, to, last thing I wanna say about this is, um, uh, I would, I would um, imagine that, well, I wanna mention the Reparative Justice Coalition of St. Louis as a response to this also, because I think, the church shouldn't, doesn't have to try to do this on its own. And, and perhaps inviting the congregants to become part of other um, organizing efforts in our city that involve you know, other congregations that involve people of various backgrounds. You know, the coalition in St. Louis involves, has members who are from um, all walks of life, various points on the political spectrum and you know, I think if my hope is that and this is the whole theory of the move of, of Equal Justice Initiatives Community Remembrance Project model that that the Reparative Justice Coalition is involved in. The hope is that in this organizing work we do to commemorate histories and legacies of racial violence, we can create a better capacity to work together um, across our differences despite of our differences um, to pursue uh, common interests. And you know, Rothberg talks about this as, as forming um, uh, long distance solidarities. He said, you know, when he's writing about implicated subjects, he says that the, the hope is that we can, by understanding how we are implicated, develop solidarities across long distances of time and space. For example, to understand how my interests are bound up with those of someone who is a descendant of people who were enslaved, who knows that they were a descendant of people who were enslaved or a victim of lynching. But also with, you know, I've been, I've been contacted by a few St. Louis residents who are white residents who are descendants of people known to have trafficked in slavery and they wanting to know what to do about that. And their families are kind of toiling with it, you know, and so, that's another way of where long distance solidarities can be formed. Um, so I don't think we all need to kind of have the same understanding. I think we need to um, work together in good faith to increase our understanding about myself included. I mean, part of why I do this, doing this research and part of why I help form Reparative Justice Coalition is because I wanna study, I wanna understand how, what impact they, they are having. Um, if I could say one other thing about the Reparative Justice Coalition and the Missouri, uh, the Community Remembrance Project, I wanna to note to our audience that, um, uh, maybe I'll put in the chat the website for the Reparative Justice Coalition, but the uh, Missouri is, you may be surprised, um, the only state so far to have a statewide community remembrance project. Um, most of these are very specific county projects that are looking at the county history of lynching and um, expected to, you know, recover. I don't know if people know about the. Um, so the columns you saw, Equal Justice Initiatives Memorial. They made two of each of those columns commemorating lynchings in the histories of counties. And the idea is that the second column, the double, will be returned to the county at the conclusion of its community remembrance work. Uh, Missouri has already um, six or eight counties or, lo or locales that have community remembrance projects underway. And we are trying to work together in a statewide initiative uh, that, you know, hopefully will uh, begin to uh, at some point be visible in terms of its impact on our political culture and, and, and our, uh, policies uh, in our state. And we'll see, we'll, we wait to see if that's true. I can't hear you, uh, Pat. I apologize. Um, you mentioned putting the Reparative Justice Coalition link in the chat, and we did have someone ask about um, 
you know, recommendations for articles or books that would support your lecture? Is there um, information on that site that would also? Um... Uh, there's not on that site a uh, reference to books and articles, though there is on, uh, this is the site I just put in the chat to the attendees. Okay. The, um, but there is on my faculty webpage. I've been I've been very committed to a, a more public facing and engaging academic practice for the for a while now, and this is why I've been moving towards more digital projects. And mm -hmm. you know, I still do the publications and everything. But I make the so if you go to my um, well, two things I'd say. One is one is visit Equal Justice Initiatives website and read some of their reports, they'll send you um, for free, they'll send you these really powerful reports on the work they're doing and why they're doing it, um, specifically related to legacies of lynching. Um, and then if you're interested in more of the social science kind of research on this, uh, some, of, some of which I mentioned, you can find a lot of it at my uh, WashU faculty webpage. Right. Uh, including, you know, I try to kind of, you know, well, let me let me not say that. It, it, it should be available. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, unfortunately, we are not going to have time for all the questions um, that are being raised. So I'm going to ask one final one. And it is from um, Terry Zlepper. Uh, Terry writes, 2042, whites become minority. How do you see landscape change in relationship? Uh, 2042, yeah. Well, I kind of feel like, you know, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is that, you know, as a sociologist works on social problems and um, somewhat of an optimist by nature. I, I do often think though that we're like, you know, the, we all of us are like the, the orchestra on the deck of the Titanic uh, an audience, you know, I, I feel like uh, 2042, we're going to get it all right. And then we're going to just be underwater or something. And uh, so, I mean, I, I say that, you know, halfway, halfway flippantly, but it, it is true that uh, we are, you know, you know, we are uh, destroying our planet. At least that's the truth I hold. Um, and and so these demographic shifts aside, um, what, will, what will we have in 2042 to live in together and work in together, work with together? Um, can we prosper and can we still thrive as a civilization is a, is a, is a real question. And I think it is bound up with um, the question of, what whites in America, in the U.S. and globally, do with their disproportionate power right now? How do they leverage the power that they've inherited? Um, you know, the unearned advantage rooted in unearned disadvantage. Today, how will that be leveraged to shape the landscape that we will have in 2042? And I don't at all mean to suggest that. People of color have no power or you know agency. Absolutely not the case, of course, but uh, it, it is a real question. I mean, it's it's incredible to me that 70 million or so people um, voted to support. And you know, I hope this. Uh, I don't know about you know. I don't. The, the views you could put on it, like a the views expressed are those of the speaker alone and not of the institution or whatever. But uh, it's incredible that 70 million Americans voted to uh, reelect a, a candidate for office who not only demonstrated profound, I think, incompetence, but also um, tied his candidacy so strongly to the uh, to to white supremacy. And um, and I know those weren't all 70 million weren't all white voters, but they were overwhelmingly. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I think, I think we see in other societies like South Africa, for example, where the white minority has always, has still manages to 
uh, hold an inordinate grip on power and resources in the country. So I don't think that the demographic shift in 2042 is actually going to result in a profound itself in any kind of profound redistribution of, of resources or recognition in our society, unless there is some commitment among the dominant group to disavow uh, white supremacy and to disinherit, you know, to disinherit this structure of inequality. Uh, and that and that's work I think uh, you know we all, we've all got to do, but I think our our um, uh, you know the so-called white population especially has to um, become committed to if we have any hope I think for our future. All right, um, Professor Ward, thank you very much. Um, I want to invite our audience um, to use the Q&A forum to express their gratitude since we're not able to offer applause. Um, and we'll make sure to share those um, comments with our speaker. Thank you very um, much for the invite. And I just in, in, I welcome people contacting me. You can reach me via email, um, easy to find, if you'd like to learn more about any of this, including the work we're doing in St. Louis. Thank you. And um, I also want to thank the audience for being with us this morning and for your thoughtful questions. I apologize that we weren't able to get to all of them. I hope you'll join us again next week when our speaker is Deanna Barch, Chair and Professor of Psychological and Brain Sciences, who will speak on early onset depression, causes, consequences, and treatments. Um, I hope to see you next week. And um, thanks again. <laughs>